Global War 36 enthusiast here with a post-game analysis of Operation A View to a Kill, AVTAC. We are heading into turn 21 and the Comintern and Axis have capitulated. This will be an Allied victory. Um, the Americans developed tech after many, many turns of trying to develop strategic rockets. They finally got it. Uh, and there's just no path for the Axis or the Common Turn to get more than eight victory points. And it's just a matter of time until the Allies take Nanking and uh, get uh, Sphere of Influence in the Pacific. So we conceded because they're just making so much money and every turn we get weaker. Uh, congratulations to the Allies. Uh, I'd like to go over uh, some of the game, the kind of review some moves that were made. I, I think what I'm going to do is go player by player. Now I started taking down the game and then I was like, oh my gosh, I need to, I need to stop uh, taking pieces off the board and, and talk about what happened. Let's start with Panzer J who was playing Germany and Italy. Um, so Panzer J uh, made an interesting move. He, I think he got a lot of Vichy ships, or a lot of uh, the French ships went to Vichy and Germany. And he also built, I believe it was a fleet carrier. It might have been a light. No, I think it was a fleet carrier with the, with the Germans and a light carrier with the Italians. Um, he had a significant force here in the Baltic because he had three naval transports and he had that carrier. I believe he had, maybe he had a battleship. I can't remember. Um, but one mistake that I think Panzer J made was he kept his fleet here in the sea zone of A-12, the turn that he hit Norway. So I think it was Boston Bruce. It might've been Hambone. I think it was Boston Bruce who showed us that Norway is, is a great thing for the Germans because it's actually like a six uh, IPP swing. You get two IPP for the land zones in Norway, but you can finally protect this um, convoy line uh, if you hold Norway. And, and then in addition, if you hold Northern Norway, you get extra, I think it's Northern Norway, you get the extra two VPs for uh, Germany uh, no, two IPPs, I mean, wartime bonus income. So you can see it's six IPP. So uh, Panzer J's swooped in, took Norway. But on that turn, I think he couldn't get his air units. I think maybe they had to land in Denmark, but they couldn't get back to Western Germany. And so he didn't have any fighters in Western Germany that turned to scramble into uh, C-Zone A-12. I believe that was turn 11. And so that was the turn that... Uh, the Soviet Union declared war on Germany, and I took out his navy. Um, I think I had, this is just all, I'm riffing off memory, but I believe I had 56 combat factors coming in. He had 51, and I think I had 14 hit points, units I could take in damage, particularly in subs, like co coastal sub and uh, four other subs. And he didn't, he had only 12 hit points, and I think 51 uh, combat factors. So uh, that battle went my way um, and I had to do it because I needed to kill those three naval transports. So that really helped the common turn who were in a, a bad pickle. Um, so that was, that was probably the only mistake I feel that Panzer J made the whole game. Um, he had really good luck as far as tech, except for a really important tech, which is uh, advanced mechanized infantry. So at one point later in the game, uh, Panzer J, he had developed 10 motorized infantry and 10 artillery, tow and 10 artillery. And he had a bunch of tanks. I think he had like seven light armor, and I can't remember, maybe he had seven medium armor and eight light armor, something like that. But he had this great uh, mobile force. But imagine if he had developed the advanced mechanized infantry earlier and those 
20 units that was 10 motorized and 10 artillery, if those 20 units that each cost four were 20 advanced mechanized or, you know, uh, 15 or 14 advanced mechanized and six Panzer Grenadiers, that would have been an amazingly deadly mobile force. Uh, so I got really lucky, just really lucky that that was the one tech that he didn't develop. Um, later in the game, I think it was turn 17, Panzer J had done a masterful job in Russia of, of preserving his force um, because I, I built a whole bunch of infantry and militia. We'll get to that when I go over mine, what happened with me. But he kept this mobile force always, he wouldn't have it be touching my stacks of infantry so I couldn't kill it because I really wanted to kill that. Um, and I didn't have much punching power. So he did a good job preserving that force until turn 17 when he saw an opportunity to take out Smolensk in such a way that I could not retake it. Um, and I, I did punish him on turn, I believe it was 17, but I couldn't get to Smolensk. At the same time, when Panzer J was realizing that he couldn't uh, get Liebenstrom, he saw that maybe he could start defending the uh, Festung Europa strategic objective. So, so he kind of, he set himself up really nicely to knock me down uh, by taking away my rapid industrialization strategic objective, not being able to hold all the cities, all the Soviet cities, because it was physically impossible. I didn't have enough units that could make it to Smolensk. <clears throat> so he set, he set the axis up to have a, a one in six chance of winning the game with the variable game end. Uh, it didn't work out for them to, to win, but that was a really good, he, he waited for his opportunity. I really respect that, that play, Panzer J, when you wait for your moment and then you throw the Hail Mary. So that was, that was a really nice move and it almost won you guys the game. Um, down with Italy. Uh, so there was this key moment when, when Panzer J realized, you know, I'm not going to be able to get Liebenstrom, uh, or Liebenstrom, I think it is. I don't think, I don't think it has a T in there. Um, so he, instead of building units to go towards Russia, he did this move that no one saw coming where, uh, the Allies had declared war on Vichy France. So Southern France aligned, uh, this was German territory. So now the Germans can build out of that port um, uh, in Southern France, a shipyard, I mean, in Southern France. And he built, I think it was five destroyers and two submarines, something like that. Seven, I think it was seven ships, or maybe he built some, some naval transports, but it was insane. All of a sudden he put down 50 IPP of units in the med here, and they ended up coming into M2, and it created a total uh, block blockade that the Allies could not get into until the very end of the game. Um, he also built a light carrier with the Italians, and I believe four heavy cruisers with the Italians. This was a very significant force. Uh, Panzer J took Malta, and then just kept reinforcing it turn after turn after turn. Um, I don't have all the German forces that were here, but I mean, it was it was so significant that basically, I think the Allies said, we're, we're just not gonna even try to get Malta. So that took away the sun never sets, which was our two victory points. Um, that was really nice, effective med strategy. Um, the Italians in Africa were really lucky and just chewed up a ton of forces. Um, I think that, uh, let's talk Spain. I think a key thing in Spain was maybe if Panzer J had started sending the, at the very end of the game, he said, okay, I'm going to go for Festung Europa and try to win the Spanish Civil War. And he started lend-leasing um, uh, medium armor into uh, the Spanish nationalists. And if he had, maybe if he had done that uh, sort of one turn earlier than having six medium armor, I don't know, but he, he got diced in Catalonia. But if he had uh, won that, again, that, that might have won the game for the Axis, put them up to eight. So uh, I, I really think that Panzer J's 
a most amazing superpower is his ability to just see an another opening and totally change directions. I'm not very good at that personally. I'm, I, I have one way of seeing things and having that mental flexibility uh, is, is a real attribute to have and almost one that access the game. Um, I tip my hat to you, Panzer J. Let's talk about my good friend, Boston Bruce. Okay, so, so I had hatred towards all. I didn't sign a non-aggression pact with Boston Bruce. I p picked at him. I was annoying. I killed two militia. Um, the CCP just couldn't catch a break. And uh, so he, he eliminated them. At one point, I think I went into Northern Manchuria with a force. He spanked that. Um, things did not go well f for me uh, against Boston Bruce. Uh, he's the kind of person you might you might want to think twice before because I think Boston Bruce carries a grudge and he comes for you with a knife. So uh, he totally shut me down with my vision of trying to take Manchuria and South Sockland Island. I I just I had a rough game. I just never got any momentum on that east in the east in Siberia. So um, he he had sent some units up here. I really like when he moved an in infantry and non combat into South Sockland Island. I think that's a good thing if you see, since since this narrow crossing uh, is is one and this narrow crossing is one, every time you see the Russians send someone into North Sockland, maybe you just send an infantry into South Sockland and, and rebuff them um, because the, the Russians have a hard time taking South Sockland Island unless it's basically empty or really weak, um, especially if they're getting significant pressure from Germany. So. As far as me, I thought Boss and Bruce really did a great job of stopping the, the common turn all the way around. Let's just talk about his gameplay. I, I said this uh, in a play test uh, that, that wasn't open to the public, but it, it, this is three games now that Boss and Bruce has killed four or more naval transports. If you're playing Boss and Bruce, you've got to watch out for your naval transports. He, he, it's catnip to, to Bruce. He cannot resist. If he sees transports sitting alone, uh, he wants them bad. You know, he, he came over and hit, I think there was one in Wake uh, that he took out, or maybe it was Caroline Islands. He took out, or he'll bomb a port where your, where your naval transports are just to, just to mess with you. Like the first thing, the, his, the way his brain works is he looks at where are the, my enemy's naval transports and how can I kill them. So let, that's something we need to keep in mind. Let's see if the, in the next game we can prevent Boss and Bruce from killing any naval transport. Uh, that'll be the first in, in four games. So he, he's really good at that. He was really clever with his strategic bomber hitting various places. Um, I, I thought he was very clever in using his Marines and hitting Places like he, t he took Atu Kakisk. I think the Allies weren't expecting that. And in the end, he hit the Pacific Northwest with those, with those troops. Um, I thought he did a great job. He was very lucky with his kamikazes. I think he hit with six out of six. Um, he, he did get lucky in that he got heavy or large ship construction and poor Hambone didn't. So that enabled him to get Kido Butai. Um, and, and that was... That went well for him. There was one turn. The one mistake I thought Bruce made was maybe on turn, was it turn 20 or maybe 19, where he went to like Formosa and uh, Luzon and the Visayas. And I think that he, he, he committed a destroyer and a Marine to each of those places, but I think they ended up getting killed. So that probably wasn't worth the IPP. Um, but it was getting towards the end of the game. Uh, he did a great job defending Nanking, but it was just a matter of economics. There's only so much you can do when, when the allies are making that much money. Brilliant, brilliantly played game, uh, Bruce. It was really fun uh, trying to fight you in the East. And uh, I think maybe, I, I, I don't know if you should sign the non-aggression pact as as the Soviets, because then you can't lend lease. So I don't know what to, what to say. I haven't figured out what the right thing to do is uh, with, the, with the Soviets and Japan. Um, but I think Bruce is smart 
in the long game to be that way because it's like I didn't want to be afraid of uh, dancing with Bruce. You know, I didn't want to. I, I'm like, I'm not going to be bullied by Bruce, but I am kind of, I am kind of bullied by Bruce. And I'm like, man, I don't know if I want to, if I want to uh, fight Bruce because he comes, he 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 makes you suffer twice as much. So in the long game, it's like, ah, man, do you just want to play nice with Bruce, uh, or or do you want to do you want to fight him? So. Uh, great, great plan. That was that was a lot of fun. Okay, let's talk about uh, Silk. I I think it's hard for me to the comments I'm going to make about Silk. I don't know if how much it's Hambone and how much was Silk. So Hambone, if I if these ideas were really your ideas, I don't mean to offend. One thing uh, that I think is important is that uh, Silk got two. French fighters and then evacuated three French fighters and one medium bomber uh, out of France. And that really helped shore up the defense of England. Panzer J is kind of notorious for, he likes to threaten England, sometimes invade Southern England or Northern England, take that factory. Um, so, so by having those three French fighters in Southern England, it really shut down any dreams that Panzer J well, it's hard to know. Maybe Panzer J would have gone for it with his three naval transports if I hadn't taken the the Navy out in the Baltic. But I don't think he would have gone for it with the three French fighters. So that was one thing that really helped the Allies early. This Portugal idea is very interesting. It's a new meta. You have Portugal worth one, and then down in Africa, there's Portuguese East Africa, which is worth one. So you pay 10 IPP to invade Portugal, and then you uh, you collect two every turn. So if you can hold that for five turns, that might be worth it. What's nice about Portugal is it's three away from New York, so you can shuttle back and forth from Portugal to New York, and you kind of set yourself up with a good position to either threaten Overlord or to threaten Spain if the if uh, the war ends, the Spanish Civil War ends, then you could go you're you're right next door to uh, to Spain. So I thought that was a very creative play. Um, I really thought that it was clever to build this shipyard right here. I like the placement of the shipyard right on the junction between I-5 and I-4 here in Aden. And then uh, Silk could put out two units here or here. Uh, he built, I, I also really want to, to say, hey, this was neat that he had this factory upgraded to a major factory in northern England, and that gave him three tech rolls. And then he developed amphibious doctrine with the British. Boy, what a great, what a great tech that is for the British, having these attack transports. Uh, at one point he had, I think he had three transports here, and he could threaten if the Soviets had taken Istanbul. Um, so this, this shipyard coupled with amphibious doctrine. Now, I think Silk had basically the luckiest start you could you could ask for because in his first, I think it was his first 10 turns of tech, I might be wrong on that, but however however many, the first 25 rolls that he had for tech, um, he got 20 successes. So that's 80% success rate on tech. You know, that is, that's an amazing start. I don't know how many games uh, the British are going to develop amphibious doctrine because you probably want to develop radar and improved construction and long range aircraft. Uh, if the Germans are going for advanced subs, maybe you want to get ASW. So there's a lot of other techs. Uh, whereas amphibious doctrine is like a nice to have tech. It's not a must have tech. So I don't know how many games you're going to get amphibious doctrine, but he had a really good start to his to his tech. Um, he did a great job constantly building the Gurkhas, pushing out of Calcutta down the peninsula here, and then taking back British Malaya. Um, took over uh, the Dutch East Indies uh, along with the Americans. Put a lot of pressure uh, on uh, the Japanese. the The best move, the game winning move, was. The, these 
this air force here in Syria, um, I didn't realize, I thought I had to hold Crimea and Istanbul. And so the aircraft could go one, two, three, bomb the shipyard, and that prevented the common term from winning. So absolutely brilliant move. Uh, even if I had all four of my aircraft there in Crimea, but he had four fighters, so there was no way I could stop him. So uh, that was, to me, that was the move of the game, uh, having the air force in Syria, and it also threatened Istanbul, so it was really, and it threatened Transcaucasia. This is a nice location to have an air base at. Um, so I tip my hat. Uh, let's talk about Hambone. Hambone, I feel really bad for you because I've seen you in game after game after game get diced by with your strategic bombers. I think maybe you've broken the curse. Um, uh, the the brilliance of you bombing, uh, Ross and Bruce brought a huge amount of his navy here to Tokyo in that shipyard. I pointed out that Boss and Bruce uh, loves to hit naval transports. Well, Hambone, the first thing he looks at is, how can I hit a shipyard or hit a, hit a major naval facility and pin a bunch of ships? He did that to me in Gibraltar like three turns in a row. Oh, I hated him so much. But it hammered home the lesson, like, be careful uh, to put all your eggs in one basket. And especially if you're playing Hambone, watch out. He's coming, he's coming to pin your navy. You know, so uh, that was that was a great move. Really nice attack there. Uh, Hambone, you had it rough with not developing large ship construction until near the end of the game. Um, I thought you did a great job. It's hard with America to balance um, this side of the map plus this side of the map, but I thought you did a really good job building up your Navy here, um, building up these forces here. You also had uh, forces that you guys went into Kudos to both Silk and Hambone for this pressure that they put up here. It not only was it good as far as IPP, it forced me to put a lot of units there. Um, so you know, it's hard to know mentally, like maybe if this hadn't happened, maybe then I would have paid closer attention to the real threat, which was Crimea. You know, you don't know how much of a factor putting pressure on your opponent in, in some other area and kind of distracting him. That is another signature of Hambone is his ability to to do misdirection. You know, look over here, look over here, pay attention to all the stuff up here. You're getting threatened in Helsinki, but don't pay attention down here in Crimea. So uh, he, like I say, uh, Hambone, I think he, I think he used to work for the CIA and he just can't let us know, you know? So, um, okay, let's talk about me. Um, I was the weakest player this game. First of all, I freaked out about, I was convinced I was gonna collapse. I think some commenters pointed out, no, don't lose hope, you know, uh, fight, fight as hard as you can. Um, my first major mistake was it, was, it was perfect that I declared war on turn 11 and went after Panzer J's Navy in the Baltic. It might've been turn 12, but I'm pretty sure it was turn 11. But I should have spent my 125 IPP that turn. Instead, I saved my money. I, I bought some AA guns because they're not discounted in the big buy. Um, but then I purchased 149 on turn 12. That was a mistake. Um, there's two reasons it was a mistake. The first is I hadn't developed improved factories. So just like Panzer J had bad luck on the one tech he really wanted, I had bad luck on improved factories, which is the tech I'd been rolling for from the beginning of the game. On the first 10 rolls, I think I got it once. I think I was 10%. I might have been 20%. It might have been that I missed the first. I only got one out of nine, and then I got the 10th was my second success. I can't remember, but I was in bad, bad shape developing improved factories. And so by waiting till turn 12, I didn't realize it was going to take me three turns to push out all the infantry that I bought. So I should have just purchased on turn 11 and not saved till I had 150 or 149. Second thing is I built way too many one movement speed units. It was horrible. I could not get those units to the front. And with Panzer J having a mobile force, I was in a bad spot because I couldn't uh, catch him. And he, he had the initiative. He could just decide if, if we were going to, 
to dance or not. And um, he he waited until the perfect time, a turn 17, when there was a chance he could win the game, took out Smolensk and not having enough attacking units really put me in a bad spot. So that was that was a mistake. Um, I I don't know what to say about Shen C. I had a really bad start with the CCP. The only good thing I had was I, I took an attack into Shejuan and I lost only one unit, I think it was. So that was that went well for me. Um, I like what Silk says, attack or die or grow or die, I think is, is Silk's phrase for CCP. But I did not grow and I died. So I rolled three 11s on my spreading influence roll. And I just think like, what if that had been the opposite? What if instead of an 11, I rolled a two? I would have had three successes on spreading influence and I could have been a beast. Things could have been totally different uh, if I had had just some luck here. Um, but I don't, I was sitting here in Shenzi where KMT got everything, I got nothing. And I thought, you know, is Bruce, is Bruce gonna want to attack me? Um, or is he gonna want me to stay alive as a foil to the KMT and he wanted to attack me? Uh, so I don't know, should I, have, should I have withdrawn to Singhai and then gone to Singhang and then shuttled units in from the Soviets? I don't know, at some point maybe you, I just decided I don't think CCP is gonna evolve this game so I'm just gonna cut my losses and not invest further. Um, I, I don't know if I should have invested more into Siberia in an attempt to get South Sokolin. I, I felt like, no, he, he just owns the coast. Anything I put there, he's, he's going to nuke. So I basically just gave up on that front. Um, down here in Iran, this is an interesting situation. I still don't know how to advise people what to do. You know, I didn't go into Iran with uh, the idea that I would get the American 2 IPP wartime bonus. I think I probably collected it between turns 11 and 17. Um, but if I had gone into here, it, it would have weakened the Allies. And in hindsight, you know, the Allies were just making so much money. Should the Soviets go in here, it's, uh, I think it was the warden, but I, I, I hope I'm not getting it wrong. Maybe it was Meme Lord. It was either Warden or Meme Lord who said, it's a swing of five IPP against the Allies if you go in because uh, the Soviets get three IPP for taking Iran and the Allies lose two IPP because they don't get the free wartime for going in. So it, it's it might be not worth it trading the... Americans getting to giving you the two for the Arctic. Maybe it's better just to go into Iran. Something something to think about. I don't know how to advise you. Let's talk about what happened uh, here in Istanbul. So at the end of the game, there was a turn when I had, I think it was 12 infantry and I and an airborne I could have dropped in here to Istanbul. I, I really have to tip my head. Another innovation from Silk was lend leasing the anti-aircraft gun to Istanbul, that was clever. He he lent lease both an infantry and an anti-aircraft gun to Istanbul while they're neutral. Only Great Britain can lend lease to neutral countries, so that's really cool and creative. Um, I could have gone in, but I was worried then on the counterattack, he could hit me, I think it was with nine units, uh, nine ground units and uh, a bunch of aircraft, because he could bring this, this guy in, that would be eight one airborne, one cavalry, and six uh, units landing from transports. He could have hit Istanbul. And then he could have reinforced with two more French units carried by this transport and then landed the four French aircraft in Istanbul. And so I was like, no, I'm not going to go in to Istanbul, but maybe I should have just gone for it because I waited so long. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It, you know, it's always hindsight's 2020, but I did, I feel like I, I did play a pretty good game and made the right decisions, except read your strategic objectives, know how the game is won and lost. You know, that is inexcusable. The mistake of the game was me not building shipyards in Crimea 
to to win the game. I could have won the game. So that everything else comes down to that. That you, it's just I was a moron and I did not. I should have taken the time, sat down and made triple sure I knew what the objectives are. I think it was Mark Twain said something to the effect of, "It's not." what you don't know that gets you in trouble. It's what you think you know that just ain't so. So in other words, uh, I think that's at the beginning of the, the big short, but it was me thinking I knew what the strategic objective was for uh, the Mediterranean, which, which Istanbul and Crimea, but it's Istanbul and a undamaged shipyard in Crimea. So, so this was so clever. This is, this is proof of, of Silk having far more experience than I do. And I bet this has happened to him or he's seen someone else do that. <laughs> so I'll, I'll remember that and hopefully other players will learn from my mistake. Um, I would say this has been one of my top three favorite games. Um, just because there were so many amazing moves and then counter plays. Uh, and it was a roller coaster where I thought, oh, I'm definitely going to lose. Like, oh, this is horrible. It's a nightmare. And then I was like, wait, maybe maybe I've got a reprieve when Panzer J built the naval units down in southern France. That took pressure off of me. And I thought, oh, maybe I'm not going to lose Moscow. Um, and then and then as things continue to go, I, I actually started to feel like, oh, maybe I, maybe I could actually win this game. Um, or maybe the Axis will win the game. The reason I really loved, the, the reason I just love this game is because it is unscripted that you anything can happen and things change and it, and people's moves have a tremendous impact on how the game plays out. So uh, I re it's really exciting and uh, there's there's a variety of different strategic approaches people can take. Um, so I, I'm looking forward to playing with this group again. I think it's we got a good group of people uh, and we're evolving and learning little by little. I had a really, there was a special moment that I want to share, which is for some reason, Hambone started whistling. He recorded in, in our WhatsApp chat, uh, Bridge Over the River Kwai. He, he whistled Bridge Over the River Kwai. And then Boss and Bruce whistled Bridge Over the River Kwai. Then I attempted to whistle Bridge Over the River Kwai. And that just, that just made, gave me so much joy made me so happy. There's, it's such a good group of people, people teasing each other nonstop. Uh, it's, it's, I really admire that uh, th there's, a, there's a definite gentleman level play where people say, hey, that I, I shouldn't have done this or um, here, is it okay if I add this non-combat move or whatever. People were really classy. Um, at the end, I wanted to at a combat move after dice had been rolled and Bruce reached out to me. He's like, nah, that's not right, my friend. You, you can't do that. You know, you can add a non-combat move or you can change where you place your units. But for example, someone couldn't go back and change what they bought or someone couldn't go back and change a combat move after uh, dice had been rolled. Unless, unless you have it marked, like Hambone's really good about putting down his combat movement markers. I think Boss and Bruce does that to a degree. Uh, Panzer J is like some sort of freak who just, he just, I don't even think he writes anything down. He just does it all from memory flawlessly. I can't do that. I have to write stuff down. So if, you, if you've if you got it written down, like Bruce and I write stuff down, uh, you got it markers placed down like Hambone and Bruce, uh, then you could, you could say, hey, well, look, I did have this marked down and uh, add that in, but you can't afterwards uh, add in another move. So anyway, sorry to go, go off. Uh, thank you so much for watching. The next uh, game will start pretty shortly. Um, I'm going to tear down my map and do a preview of the flag map of version 4.1. I don't know that I'll get uh, op the next operation started right away, but maybe I can do a preview for it. It's been a great game. I salute my opponents.